Jesus, right? Jesus is our shepherd, right? So he says this, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, who is God, and the sheep listen to his voice. Here's the most important part. Can you hear me over there? Can you hear me back there? It's the most important part, right? Isaac's not happy. He wants to sit in my lap. All right. It says this, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. This means what? This means he knows your name and 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 your name. And, your name. and, and what is your name? Levi. He even knows Levi. But I knew your name. And he knows your name. He loves you. He knows your name. He knows your name. He knows you by name. How awesome is that? That the God that loves you sent you a shepherd that knows you by name. Right? And he calls to you. And he wants you to follow him. Right? So we have a box. Zoe, I will need your help for this. Can you help me with this? Can you help me with this? So un, un, take the ribbon off. Take the ribbon off, but don't open the box yet. Yeah, she needs some help, but she's got it. All right, so, so here's the thing. I wanted to give you a reminder that you are the sheep and you have a shepherd, okay? And so now we can take the lid off the box. Let's take the lid off the box, and let's see what's inside. What is inside? What is this? What is this? It's a sheep. It's a little lamb. It's a little lamb, right? So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Ask me what I named my lamb. I did not name my lamb Jesus. What do you think I named my lamb? What it? My name Corky? No, no. There's already, the world can only handle one Corky. Bob. It's not Bob. It's not Isaac. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let me just tell you the name of my lamb is Lawrence the Lamb. Lawrence the Lamb. But he goes by Larry. He goes by Larry. You can call him by Larry. So listen, listen, listen. When you leave today, when you leave today, everybody, all of you children, not the adults, you children will all get a lamb. And then here's the thing. I want you to name your lamb and put it in your room in a place where you can be reminded that the Lamb of God, who is Jesus, came to be your shepherd and to guide and lead you always, right? And so you'll be reminded by that. So just as you have named your Lamb, right, Jesus knows your name, right? So exciting times. So something to look forward to at the end. Yes. I am actually going to give more than 100 kids a lamb. It is crazy. Absolutely. And... It's made possible because Pastor Kelly Winston makes me look good. So, all right, hey, 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 you can name me yours, Bob. I don't. It's just, I'm. I'm not care. In fact, you should all. You should all email me what you named your lamb. So, um, all right. Okay. So, all right. We gotta. We gotta pray. We gotta pray. So, everybody, put their hands together. All right. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. All right. Unless you're walking around, bow your heads. All right, oh, bow your head, bow your head, close your eyes. All right, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you this morning, and I give thanks for these little lambs here that you've trusted us with and that we get to be a church that values children, that we value our children in this church, and we value children who do not have families and homes all over the world. Father, we're thankful to be a church that supports orphans and adoption and foster parenting. And Father, we give you all the glory and all the thanks in everything that we do. And so, Father, I pray that these little lambs here will have a fun day naming their lamb. But I hope that the most important thing they remember is that they are known by name by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of God's little children said, amen. amen. All right. On your way out after church is over, that means you can't leave early. After church is over, Pastor Jessica and Pastor Kelly have lambs for you. Thank you, guys. See you later. All right, I think there's one there. As uh, as the kids head on back, this is I'm getting to choose the things I want to do here at the end of my career. So, uh, 
we want Mark and Judy to come and lead our time of prayer over our offering this morning. Uh, so if you're visiting with us, you just let that plate go by. This is really for those people that are part of the Georgiana family to bring their ties to the storehouse. So, uh, and while the offering's taking place, we have chosen a really powerful video for you to watch while we're taking the offering. Amen? Amen. Good morning. Would you all pray with us? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today with grateful hearts. Resurrection Day reminds us that you gave us the ultimate gift of the opportunity for eternal life through your Son, Jesus. Any gifts that we return to you pale in comparison to that world-changing sacrifice. Everything we have is only ours because you allowed it in our lives. We are simply returning a small portion of that which you entrusted to our care. Thank you, Father, that because of your generosity toward us, our church can stand ready to help those in need in our community and around the world. We can faithfully support our amazing staff and reach out to add more believers to your family. May the generosity and faithfulness of our people be a beacon of hope in our community and beyond to the ends of the earth. And may we, the people of Georgiana Church, be effective in spreading the everlasting joy that can only be found in you, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Piece by piece, brick over brick, and one step after another he walks. As the broken shards of my shipwrecked heart splinter his hands and the weights, of an impatient world weighs heavy on his shoulders, death grows closer to this man who's supposed to be our king and redeem the majesty that he has hidden in me, but he seems just as broken as I am and just as defeated. All his talk of freedom seems significantly cheapened since he's been beaten like a slave. His flesh hangs like tattered rags, cleaning over this mess of my life as whips. Stain his skin the same color as my transgressions. A crimson mural of my immoral imperfections are painted on his back as I sit back and watch the word of life take on my death sentence to pair a graphic display of love and affection. I can't help but question God, shouldn't that be me? If I'm the one that's sold, then shouldn't I be the one to reap? For my sin is indeed a seed sown deep into this ground that you've made of me. And I've played the harlot of horticulture. I've hoarded culture and tradition and submitted to their religion instead of your relationship. So I, with the going down of your son, I feel shunned by what I've done. So I run and hide in the fig leaves that my seed has sown me. I've grown deep inside this garden and lots of heart in my heart. So pardon me if I don't believe in being fruitful anymore. But the only thing that multiplies here is my shame. The only thing my soul knows how to grow is colder towards you. So I thought that the hardness of my harvest would have cropped the warmth out of your love. But yet you still sent your son to die that I might become come one piece by piece brick by bloody brick they beat you black and blue shades of night spent knees bent at the corner of my deathbed hoping that yours would be the truth that my heart would wake up to instead of a nightmarish reality that my days have become his face bears the type of pain that my shame deserves as skin is violently ripped from his body he short of breath for all my shortcomings whips cut skin for the moments when i don't cut it nails drive deep into both hands and feet they label him a thief as if that's supposed to be me but he he never speaks only lets the broken body language of his suffering explain that this as who we always intended for it to be for if my life couldn't set me free, then my death wouldn't be any different. Yes, the wages for sin are death, but even our deaths are insufficient. For it's only by holy blood is a broken heart mended. But it's only by righteous love is such righteous blood given. So they beat him within an inch of his everlasting life to show the immeasurable size of his unending love. We were sunk deep in sin since the fall of men. So he set a course for our ocean floor as if going down with the ship was his intent the whole time. As if to say that I am a lost cause worth searching for. That he would write his name on the torn pages of my story. That all honor and glory would be to the father who authored the very book of life. And is gracious enough to handwrite my name. We robbed him him of his blood just as he robbed our graves 
And the very tombs that we deserve to be laid in piece by piece, brick by brick, he becomes my sins. The very walls I built to keep him out, he lays them down so that he is now the bridge between a broken man and the God that deserves him. I've always known that sticks and stones could break my bones, but who'd have thought that a wooden cross would meet the rock of my salvation and we trade places and his bones will be breaking for my restoration. His blood spills as payment to purchase our graves and fashion them in the newness of life where he hangs deaf like an ornament and decorates the sting out of it that we might no longer fear what is hidden in the dark but that the darkness would fear what is revealed in us through the light precious is this life that paid the price for our debt that even while we yet stood blasphemous God demonstrates his love on display for all to see Christ crucified paying the ransom of the guilty in full that we might have the fullness of life in the type of abundance that shook the shackles of death off of his body, he is risen and he is king.
much you can do oh god of wonders your power has no Things you've done before in greater measure you will do again. Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move. All things are possible. Trust in you Stronghold will come. I hear the chants hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people. Come awaken this city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will come. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out.
Amen, amen. You can be seated this morning. But church, as you're doing that, listen, he is risen. Oh, wait, wait, wait. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Hallelujah, church. Let's give God praise one more time. Church, that's called the Paschal greeting, which basically is a fancy word to say. It's an Easter greeting. It's what churches have done for centuries to celebrate this day, celebrate this day where we know that our God is risen. And this is why we are here. That same new, powerful, resurrected life that Jesus experienced, it's available for you and for me right now, right? This is what the whole church is built on. Our very existence as a church hangs on this affirmation that he is risen. He is risen indeed. If you don't know me, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. It is my just very high privilege to be able to preach on Easter Sunday. So thank you, Corky, so much for this honor. I don't take it lightly. Uh, He also, he has a a stick with a hook on it right here. So it makes me a little nervous in case I go too, too long or something. But thank you all for joining us today. There's nothing quite like being in worship on Easter. Amen? Now listen, we've done this for Easter and Christmas the past several times, and I want to repeat it the exact same way. Parents in the room, take a deep breath. You're good. If your kids get a little wacky, it's good. Parents in the room, no big deal. All right? Here we go. So on Easter, what we really celebrate is a new normal. Have you heard this term before? A new normal. So in the, in the uh, financial crisis of 2007, 2008, economists to- coined this term, a new normal. What they're referring to is what businesses and industries had to change in light of the recession that was following for another four or five years after that financial crisis. And these weren't just short-term changes. On the contrary, the idea of a new normal was a caution that things were not just going to go back to the old normal. As hard as it it was going to be, businesses that wanted to survive, they were going to have to redefine a word that strongly resists redefinition, right? What harder word is there to redefine than the word Normal. Normal implies that things stay the same, right? Normal implies comfort, familiarity. Normal is what you have grown accustomed to. So Allie and I in our marriage, we had our own new normal moment. Uh, It was approximately 10 years, 5 months, and 3 days ago, (laughs) give or take, give or take. At that point in our lives, at that point in our marriage, we were very comfortable. We knew what normal was, right? Everything was familiar territory. We had enough time. We had enough money, we had enough sleep, and then, and then we had a child. And and we had this kind of what is our new normal discussion over and over and over again. Now here's an example, take a look at this picture. For a while, we thought that our new normal was trying to spend all day every day keeping this face from happening, right? Or keeping it from getting any worse. And now we're like 10 years into this thing. I've seen that face many times. I'm getting comfortable with it now. We're 10 years into this thing. Things have have never been the same. Life will never be the same. It has been a new normal. You know, in the same way, I think it's sometimes unfortunate that Easter is a holiday. Because honestly, when you celebrate something as a holiday, it kind of carries with it this idea that it's going to come and go on its annual schedule, and then things will go back to normal, right? This is what happens when we have holidays. Many times we as the church, we celebrate Easter only to kind of go back to normal the very next week. And of course, we'll ask each other, okay, how was your Easter? How was your Easter, right? But it's not simply a holiday, Easter is an experience, one that invites us to reorient our very lives in light of what has happened. Things will never be the same. Things should never be the same. It is a new normal. So today I want to take a look at the story of Easter Sunday. What did happen on that first Easter Sunday? And then I want to look at a story after the story, if you will. And so this is going to be in the book of Luke chapter 24. You can open there if you would like. And while you're doing that, I'm going to get my water because I had no idea how dry I would feel right now. Luke 24, 
We're going to start at verse 1. It says this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. So here's what's happening. There are these faithful female followers of Jesus. And what they're doing is they've had a friend who has died. They've had a leader in their lives who has died. And so they do what they would always do. They want to go anoint a dead body as per their customs. And it says this, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Another translation that I read said this, two men stood by them in glittering apparel. Because listen, your Easter duds are important, right? We all get this. I'm wearing a bow tie today, you know? Glittering apparel. Thank you. Thank you. And in their fright, as we keep on going, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven, the the remaining disciples, and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, mother of James, and the others who were with them that told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Men in the room, look at me. Men in the room right here. Don't be that guy, okay? If you don't hear anything else this morning, don't be that guy. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what must have happened. So this is that original Easter morning story, right? This is what happens. It's a a story marked by confusion and fear and even like distrust, right? I mean, thank God for the faithful female disciples of Jesus, amen? Amen. Amen. And so you're going to read some sort of variation of that sort of story in all four of the books of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll see something like that. In every single one of them, you'll see this common theme of like knee-jerk doubt. Like that's where their minds go first. It goes right to questioning, to need more information, to not trust the women, which is a bad move always, right? But Luke follows this story with a story that only he tells. And this follow-up story is probably the most developed post-Easter appearance story that we have. And let me tell you why it's important. In the middle of the confusion, in the middle of the skepticism, it gives us a glimpse into what might move someone from doubt to faith. And listen, it is not what you think it is. Luke tells a story of two disciples that up until that point, you haven't seen them just yet. Now, maybe we forget this in light of the drama of Jesus' trial and and, and crucifixion and his burial, but the whole scene takes place around the Jewish tradition of Passover. So Passover commemorates God's actions in their history. He rescued them from slavery in Egypt. And for a Jew in the first century, this was important. These two disciples have made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for Passover, and the story picks up with them on the road to a town called Emmaus. And so we keep going in Luke 24, same day as the empty tomb, but this is how it continues to unfold. It says this, the same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Now pause there just for a second. I want to make sure we get the feel of what's happening here. If you've read uh, many of the stories of Jesus and his followers, you know that they are filled with travel, right? So Jesus travels through Samaria, or his followers, they go through Galilee. Somebody else goes to the Decapolis. They're constantly moving. This is just just kind of what they do in these stories. But listen, this traveling story is different. Two followers of Jesus, they go to Jerusalem for Passover because they're Jewish. And that's just what they did. And this trip, this pilgrimage, something that they may have done every single year, this time they could have never predicted how it would all unfold. And so now, in our story, our travelers are headed to Emmaus, but where are they really going? They're probably going home. Emmaus is probably their home, and they're headed back from their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. But this time, after all that has happened, the return trip feels quite a bit different, doesn't it? They're probably shell-shocked. 
They're probably deflated. They're probably trying to, trying to process everything that has happened. The world itself probably feels different, and they're not sure how. There's probably going to be a new normal as they process all this. And so this is the sort of feel that we should get with these travelers in Luke. And it says this in verse 14. They're talking with each other about everything that had happened. Imagine that conversation about everything that had happened. But the story continues in verse 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? I love that, I love that line. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have happened there in these days. What things, he asked. Now, I have to, I have to stop again, because when I read this story, I've read this many times, maybe you have as well. When I read the story, I get so distracted right there, because I read the Bible kind of weird, and, and I'm imagining what Jesus' poker face may have looked like in this moment, right? Did you hear this? What things, Jesus said, like, please tell me more about what must have happened in Jerusalem these past few days. I have no idea, right? And then Cleopas is like, yeah, this guy, Jesus, was crucified. And Jesus is like, what? That's crazy. Sorry, that's how it goes in my head. Here's how it really went. Jesus says, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. And Jesus is like, three days, that's, that's crazy. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us what they had, they had seen, a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, because duh, but they did not see Jesus. And that's it. That is their report of what happened. Like this part drives me crazy. Here's all of the stuff that happened in Jerusalem, all the stuff that you would have to be living under a rock not to know apparently, right? You know, Jesus is tried and executed and buried and oh yeah, there's been reports that he's still alive and the tomb is empty, but I really gotta be headed back home to Emmaus. You know, I can't really stay to see how this all unfolds. I, I, I got to get back. I'm, I mean, if he's alive, he'll tweet about it, right? We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll find out. No big deal. There is an empty tomb. There's an empty tomb, and it should be a massive hint to the disciples that God is doing something, that God is on the move. But in every telling of this resurrection story, nobody knows what to do with an empty tomb. Church, do we know what to do with an empty tomb? When we have the evidence that God is moving all around us, do we know what to do with it? Do we know what to do with the empty tomb? Listen, here's what I know to be true about today. Look around. We are more full today and on Christmas than we will ever be the rest of the year, right? Now, please hear this. If this is one of those couple of times that we will see you this year... I am thrilled that you're here. I really am, I promise. I love that you're here. But I have to ask, what keeps you from really diving into this thing? What keeps you from coming back next week and the week after that and the week after that? I, I think we have the evidence that God really is on the move. Powerful things are happening. Did you see the Compassion Sunday total, right? Right? It's kind of like the disciples who look in on the tomb, but they're not exactly sure what to do with it. We can see that God is moving. Do we know what to do with it? We're going to have a day today where we can be confident that God is moving. We're singing. We're enjoying these adorable children, right? We're taking communion together. We're celebrating an empty tomb. Do we know what to do with it? What would keep this from becoming your new normal? You see, when I read this story about these followers, it, it tells me there's something that has to happen before your new normal. There's something that has to happen. It, it hasn't happened for the disciples just yet in this story, and, and maybe you're waiting on it as well. 
We have a term for this too. This term is watershed moment. I love that phrase, watershed moment. It, it talks about, it's based on mountains and rivers and rainfall. We used to live in the mountains of Tennessee, and, and they talk about the watersheds up there. So essentially, there's a mountain in a place or a ridge or something that divides the way that rainfall is ultimately going to fall and drain, right? And so at one point, on one side of the mountain, it falls and drains on this side into this watershed. And on this side of the mountain, it falls and drains on this side into this watershed. You get it. Watershed moments. Or those times in our lives where we realize that everything is going to be different. From here on out, everything is going down a whole new path. So about 500 years ago, Martin Luther gave us a watershed moment. He had 95 theses and he gave birth to the Protestant church and everything has gone different from there on out. In the 1960s, Martin Luther King gave us another watershed moment with the civil rights movement, and everything has been different from there on out. Apparently, if your name has Martin Luther in it somewhere, you're going to be part of something big. I just need to tell you that. Just get ready, okay? The disciples going back to Emmaus, they finally have their watershed moment, and it goes like this. Later that night, Jesus joins them for dinner, and it says this. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and begin to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. If you've seen the movie The Princess Bride, you know what just happened here, right? In the movie, there's a farm boy named Wesley who falls in love with Buttercup and, and every order, every request that she gives him, his response is always the same. It's what? As you wish, right? Farm boy, do this as you wish. Farm boy, fetch that as you wish. The story goes on, they lose touch. She thinks that he's been killed along the way. But when they reconnect, she doesn't fully recognize him. She doesn't fully know who it is until he's falling down a hill, answering her with, as you wish, right? The disciples would remember when Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and fed 5,000 people. The disciples would remember when he took bread, and blessed it, and broke it, and shared the Last Supper with them. And so now, one more time in this story in front of them, he takes bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and it's that as-you-wish sort of moment. Suddenly, their eyes are open. They know who this is. And for these disciples in particular, it is their watershed moment. From this point on, everything is different. Like rainfall going down another side of the mountain, everything is different. From this point on, they can't go back. And in fact, they don't go back. They don't go back to Emmaus. The story ends and it says they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. It's a new normal. And, and listen, they, they can't just go back home after this. And I would say that we can't just go back home. Encountering the risen Jesus, a dead man come back to life is a watershed moment. You don't just go back to normal. Listen, I pray today, church, that you cannot just go back to normal. I love this story. The story of the Emmaus travelers, it tells us so much about what it looks like and what it feels like to be an imperfect human being who struggles with doubt and struggles to put themselves out there and struggles with belief sometimes. Someone who doubts or is skeptical, maybe someone who struggles to put their heart out there at times because they don't want to be disappointed again. I mean, think of these disciples. They saw their friend and their leader and their teacher, and they saw him killed. I mean, how, how hard is it going to be to try and believe again? But this story, it tells me, even in those times when we are so slow to believe, so slow to just take him at his word, so slow to realize the number of ways that God is moving all around us, even in those times, Jesus still meets us. He walks alongside us, even when we're headed in the wrong direction. The story tells me what it looks like to encounter and follow the risen Jesus to move from a place of doubt to a place of faith. And here's what I'm learning. It doesn't look like what you think it does. It doesn't happen like you think. Moving from doubt to belief, I don't think it happens like we think it does. When I read Luke 24, what I see 
is disciples who are scrambling for answers. They should have a good idea of what's going on. They have some pretty compelling evidence that God is on the move, right? There's an empty tomb. There's men in their lightning clothes, you know? There, there's a, a burial cloth, but no body. Oh, oh, and then there's the words of Jesus that said this was going to happen the entire time, right? But they're still looking for answers. Like Peter just wonders what may have happened. The Emmaus travelers, they don't even have time to stay and wait for the story to unfold. They just head back home, right? There's this like stubborn refusal to believe until all of the questions have been answered. And this is us. And I think this is probably some of us here today. There might be, this might be one of those reasons why someone only dips in on Easter and Christmas, but they're not really here. You see, we live in an age where it's really, really important to have all of the proof and all of the evidence and all the questions figured out first, and then we'll put ourselves out there. And then we'll, we'll choose to believe. But listen, that's not how faith works. And in this story, we, we see how it really happens. After the travelers, they unload on Jesus about all of the stuff that happened in Jerusalem, how Jesus was supposed to be this, but it turned out this way, and they're not really sure what to do with it all. Jesus then says this. He says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe. Literally in Greek, he says they're slow of heart. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. But, but here, here's what's wild to me. Jesus explains it all to them. And it's not enough. It's not enough. They get their questions answered, but that's not when they finally get it, these two travelers. See, I have this feeling that those of us who are here today that might struggle with the truth of all this, those of us who want to have it all figured out first, I have this feeling that even if you were to get all of those answers that are so important to you, I don't know, I have this feeling that it may not be enough for you. The amazed travelers, they begin to actually see and believe not when he answers their questions, but when they experience what Jesus does, he breaks bread for them, and they get it. All day on that first Easter, the disciples kind of bumble around, even though the evidence that God is up to something is right there. An empty tomb, grave clothes, no body. Literally, God walking next to them on the road as they travel. The disciples don't have all their questions answered, but I would argue they do have what they need. There's plenty of evidence that God is actually at work all around them. And there are some folks in this room today where you may not have all of your questions answered, but I would say you do have plenty of evidence that God is at work all around you. And so here's what Jesus would say to his followers then and to his followers now. Stop being slow of heart. Stop being so slow of heart. Don't wait to trust Jesus until your curiosity is satisfied. Trust him now because he really is moving all around us. I see it. And, and I would go out on a limb and I would say you can probably see it too. We will literally break bread together here in just a moment. So what if you met him today, not in getting your questions answered, but what if you met him in a meal instead? Don't be slow of heart. It's not about getting your answers. It's about experiencing his presence. This could be your watershed moment this morning, church. There's something else I see in this story about encountering a risen Jesus. It's this. You can't just go back home. You can't just go back to the old normal. See, I guarantee the question on the disciples' minds that first Easter, I guarantee it was not how was your Easter and how was your Easter. It was probably something more like, what now? This changes everything, so what do we do now? Because you can't just leave Jerusalem and go back to Emmaus. You can't just go back to what you have always done. See, when you encounter the risen Jesus, it is a watershed moment for you. It's a whole different path from here on out, and it will be a new normal. And here's the cool thing. 
If you really want to see what the disciples' new normal looks like, you just have to look at Luke's next book. In the book of Acts, if you don't know, it's kind of like a part two to the book of Luke. And and you're given a chance to see what the followers of Jesus actually begin to look like after their watershed moment, after they encounter the resurrection. The very Spirit of God begins to infuse them with their own new life, their own resurrected life, and they are different people. And from the end of Luke to the beginning of Acts, these people go from scared and confused and full of doubt to an absolute force. You see the early church begin to form and people are healed and people are set free and not even the most violent persecutions can snuff it out. This is their new normal. It is such a different story. There's such different people that Luke, the writer, it's like he puts his pen down and he's like, you know what, this, this is a whole different story. I've got to write a new book about this one, right? Such a different story. And in part two, in the book of Acts, Luke tells you exactly what this looked like. It says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Now listen, you remember those guys who were so scared and so insecure, they couldn't even trust the women around them. Now it's signs and wonders. These are different people. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions, gave to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Church, this is the difference that it makes when you encounter the risen Jesus. A watershed moment turns into a new normal which may as well be a whole new book about your life. Before they had figured it all out, Jesus tells the two travelers that they are slow of heart to believe. But then after he appears in front of them, after he disappears, they look at each other and they say, didn't our hearts burn within us? And so church, how do you go from slow of heart to hearts that are burning. It's not how you might think. It's not going to be when you get all of your answers. It's going to be when you start to see the evidence that God is really moving all around you. It's not your mind that's going to burn because it's satisfied. It's your heart that's going to burn because it's fulfilled. There's a classic story about John Wesley, who's the founder of Methodism. He's a great leader in the 18th century Great Awakening. Wesley had followed in his father's footsteps as a clergyman in the Church of England. And he's doing all the right things, following all the right steps. But when you really read about him, you get this idea that he probably had all of the head knowledge figured out. But he was slow of heart. But one night in London, he's dragged to a worship service in a whole different tradition. And he says this, it says, In the evening, I went very unwillingly, he lets you know, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. Think about that the next time you want to complain about a boring sermon, okay? It's not even Romans, it's the preface, you know? And it says this, about a quarter before nine, While he was describing the change in which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Church, this is the story of the conversion of a clergyman. This is someone who should already have it all together. This is someone who should already have the right answers. And it is he himself who is the convert. Because suddenly, like it's never happened before, suddenly, just like the Emmaus travelers, he experiences Jesus, actually experiences Jesus, not when his mind is figured out, but when his heart begins to burn. And so I I think the most important post-Easter question for us is not going to be, How was your Easter? How was your Easter? It's probably going to be our hearts burning within us. Have we encountered the risen Jesus? Have we had our watershed moment? It may be for the first time ever, and I would love that if that was the case this morning. Or maybe you're more like Wesley. 
Maybe you've sat in seats just like these for years, but your own heart feels like it's a little bit slow, it's a little bit cold. Today could be it. We're about to break bread together. So wherever you are today, whether you have your questions answered, whether your curiosity is satisfied or not, I would invite you to experience Jesus, to meet Jesus, to recognize Jesus as we will share a meal together. Ten years ago, our our new normal happened. We named her Zoe, which means life. And for a decade now, I've had a front row seat at just watching life happen in front of me. It has been my new normal, and I wouldn't go back to the old one for the world. And I grew up in church, and so you might say that my new normal started a long time ago and that I haven't really known anything else, but that's not really true. That John Wesley story has been my story over and over and over again. I've experienced just how faithful God is that even when my heart is less than warm, even when my heart is cold, even when I probably have all that I need in front of me, when I'm staring down at the empty tomb, and even then, When I still have this desire for answers, even then, he has been faithful just to walk beside me. And not necessarily that I would get all the answers, but just to let me experience his presence instead. It's been my story. And I'm reminded of how he's been on the move the entire time. And my heart is warmed over and over and over again. If you're looking for all the evidence and all the proof, you you may never be satisfied. But I would go out on a limb, and I would say you probably have all that you need. New life is happening. One of the things I love about Georgiana is that dead things are coming alive all over the place. So get your front row seat. This can be your watershed moment. Church, this can be your new normal. And church, make no mistake, this is that meal. And so on the night when Jesus gave himself up for us, he did something that people for years would continue to remember him for, would continue to recognize him for. And so what he did was he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said that this was his body. And it was given for us. And so now as often as as we would take part in this, as often as we would take part in his body for us, that we would do it in remembrance of him. And then he took a cup and he blessed it. He said that this was his blood of the new covenant. His blood poured out for us for the forgiveness of sins. His blood that was there in order to give us that same resurrected life that he was going to experience. He said as often as we would drink it, to do it in remembrance of him. So church, let's pray this morning. God, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and juice, I pray that they would be for us the body and the blood of Christ. That we would be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. God, I pray that this could be a watershed moment for us. Maybe a first one. I pray that... God, I pray. There we go. This would be a watershed moment for us, maybe for the first time, maybe after many times, either way. But I pray that this would be the starting point of a new normal. I pray that this would be the starting point of this whole new book about our lives, one where we just put the pen down and we're like, okay, this is, this is something different. So I pray that we would not try to just simply go back home, go back to what's familiar this would be something altogether new. God, I pray that this would bring new life to dead places. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I want to invite those who are coming to help serve this morning, go ahead and come on down. And and as they do that, just to kind of walk you through how this happens here, it's a little bit different than uh, how we do at our main campus. And so uh, 
what you'll do is you're, you're going to kind of go ahead and come forward and you'll receive communion as you come forward to the front uh, and you'll receive a piece of bread. You'll dip it in the cup and then we'll receive communion that way. And how you do that is you'll just follow the ushers. Don't ask any questions. Just follow the ushers on down. And if you need gluten-free communion, that'll be actually at the table right here. Janice or Mona will help you out with that if you need gluten-free communion. So there'll be three stations. Uh, if you want the piece of bread and the juice and then gluten-free is at the table itself. So church... The table is set this morning. So I would invite you one more time, be open to a watershed moment as you come today. Go ahead and come.
Be. 
you to your feet this morning. And I hope that you did have a watershed moment this morning, seeing the risen Christ, believing the risen Christ, believing that he is alive. So we're going to go out this morning celebrating what Jesus has done for us, proclaiming his cross, his freedom, his life. Let's sing. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, your praise, King Jesus, to God in Easter celebration. He is risen, and I hope that colors the way that you live your day, your week, and your life. He's alive. Have a great week. We hope to see you back on campus at Georgiana next Sunday. Happy Easter.